Welcome to High Cheese with Darren Maloney. Today is Friday, October 7th, 2022. Jair Bolsonaro. Remember that name. And remember, I think it was a week ago, I had mentioned that the populists continue to win. And Jair Bolsonaro was is the sitting president of Brazil. And he's running in a tight race against uh, Lalu, a uh, far leftist ex-jailbird. So they're throwing the wrench at Bolsonaro, the criminals, the Brazilian version of the Democratic Party, and they're coming after him strong. And uh, they had their elections on Sunday, and the press was out to get Bolsonaro. Polls came out and said that, oh, Lalo was going to win on the first ballot. The last poll that I saw from Brazil had Bolsonaro down 14 points. Well, guess what happened? They, they ran on Sunday and they're having a runoff. Now, Lalu got 48% of the vote and uh, Bolsonaro got 43% of the vote, which requires a runoff because um, in Brazil, if you do not get fi- over 50% of the vote, the top two candidates uh, go to the next round and run in a runoff. So it's Lalu versus Bolsonaro. But here's my take on this thing, is that what the press and what the pollsters were doing in Brazil is the same thing they're doing here. It's all suppression polls. It's all make-believe polls. So instead of Bolsonaro losing on the first ballot, losing by 14 percentage points, he's in a runoff. And anything can happen. And I think it's October 30th when the runoff election in Brazil takes place. And I've really got a good feeling about this uh, upcoming November midterm election. And it's a similar feeling I had in 2016 when Trump won. And I really sensed over this past week or two, I think the tide was really uh, turning for the Republicans. And they're coming strong, particularly in the Senate with the Senate candidates. And uh, it's just my gut feeling. You know, you look at these suppression polls and these suppression polls say that the Democrats are going to win. The generic poll says that people uh, want Democrats and not Republicans. And it's nothing more than fantasy. And MAGA and uh, many of the populists here in the United States are onto it. They figured it out long ago. And one of the reasons that I'm feeling real good about November 8th is uh, the Arizona Senate debate, Blake Masters versus Mark Kelly. And, you know, all the polls you saw, uh, Masters was down anywhere from seven points to four points, and he was consistently down. And again, these are the suppression polls. So Blake Masters really did what he had to do on Thursday's debate. So let me just play uh, a couple of clips from the debate, and then we'll come back and discuss with Blake Masters. Hi, I'm Blake Masters. I'm running to be your next senator because our current senator, Mark Kelly, has messed everything up. Our border is in chaos. We've got drugs and illegal aliens just pouring in. Crime is up. The cost of groceries, actually the cost of everything you need to live, keeps going up and up. It wasn't like this two years ago. What changed? Well, Joe Biden took over. And in Washington, Mark Kelly backs Joe Biden every single time without thinking of Arizona. You know, it's not what he said he'd do. Two years ago, Mark Kelly stood right there and he promised to be independent. But he broke that promise. And Masters hits a home run right here. He encompasses everything that is going to make the Republicans win in November. And every Senate candidate that it is in a contested election, has to look at this debate and see what Masters did. And you have to apply the same strategy, the same toughness, and the same vision for this country. Now, I just want to go back to a second part of the, of the uh, debate. <laughs> and he, he, you know, he, he just humanizes this. This is what Joe Biden and the Democrats have done to this country. Masters personalizes this. He makes this about him and his family. And we all can relate to what he's going to say next. So let's go to this clip and then we'll come back and discuss. 
My wife, Catherine, and I grew up right here in Arizona. We're raising our three little boys here now. And we're sick of seeing Arizona families suffer just because Mark Kelly wants to fit in in D.C. Send me to the U.S. Senate, and I will put Arizona families first. Thank you. And I really do think that uh, Masters is going to pull this off as a result of this debate. And I'm looking forward to see what the next suppression poll says. And a rule of thumb here, any, any of these polls that come out, you know, just add, add six points conservatively to the Republican candidate in general. These polls are skewed. These polls are intended to keep you home and discourage you. It's intended to give the, uh, the mass media talking points on their daily and weekly shows. And anyone that is associated with Trump, anyone that is associated with MAGA is going to be attacked. So I'm really looking forward to, to see what the next poll is that comes out. Now, this is going to be a tight race either way because you still have your Democrats. You still have your uh, consulting class in Arizona that's going to back the Democrats. And you still have remnants of McCain, the McCain organization left uh, in Arizona that hates Trump. So it's going to be close. I'll be very surprised if it's a, a, a big win. But the one thing I think that is a downside of Masters' debate is that the Democrats may not even want to debate any of the Republicans because of this. Now, if you notice that none of the Democrats want to debate, they're, they're, they're hemming and hawing about a debate. You look at in, in Pennsylvania, Fetterman doesn't want to uh, debate. He only wants to commit to just one debate. And, and that's a debate uh, uh, that's going to take place after the mail-in votes start coming in. Because they have nothing to hang their hat on. Nothing. And it seems to be the Democratic strategy to push off all these debates. Same things happen up in New York with the gubernatorial race. Hochul doesn't want to debate. But you got to, at some point, you got to tell the people what you stand for. It's not enough just to hide. And that's all the Democrats can do right now is hide. Because they cannot hang their hat on anything. And this is only going to reinforce the DNC. They're probably sitting in Washington right now. Oh, my God, we can't debate. we got to be able to get out of it. Can we make Fetterman sick again to get out of this? What can we do? How can Hulk get out of a debate? All over, that's what they're thinking right now. And remember, don't get overconfident. You still have to come out and vote. It's looking very good for the Republicans. But you have to come out and vote. And each of the Republican candidates isn't perfect MAGA, isn't a perfect populist, but it's a binary decision. Again, take a look at Pennsylvania. You may not like Oz. He may not be the best uh, candidate. He may not have been your candidate, but he's better than Fetterman. So just remember that. Now, as some of you know, I signed up to be a poll worker in Morris County. New Jersey. And, you know, I, you know, for the, those who don't know, uh, Morris County is uh, one of the few uh, Republican areas in the state of New Jersey. Uh, Morris uh, County is also the place that gave us Chris Christie. So with that said, I went for training this week and there was about 75 to 100 people that showed up. And I just, my observation, I just want to point out an observation I have. It, it appeared that the Democrats that showed up were all wearing masks. And those that weren't wearing masks were Republicans. And I, and I, you know, I think I've heard this before. A lot of uh, the masks to Democrats are what MAGA hats, red hats are to uh, Trumpers. And uh, I, I just think it's funny. You know, they, they, they walk around with these masks and it's supposed to be some sign of virtue. It's just so shallow and vapid and meaningless when you look at the, the masks that they're wearing and the fact that the masks that they're wearing don't work. So I just think it's kind of funny. So I just wanted to point out another observation. So there was a representative from the county clerk's office, and they were talking about the, the voting machine and the iPad that they were giving all the poll workers that uh, contained the um, voting list. And they made such an emphasis on the voting machine not being con uh, in contact with the Internet. And as you can see, the voting machine 
will have no access to the Internet, and no one on the Internet will have access to the voting machine. And, yeah, I'm okay. No, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't believe it, but keep on going. But then he went on to say, the iPads that he handed out that contained the voting list had access to the Internet. And the Internet had access to those iPads with the voting list. So they want you to focus all on the machines, but they don't want you to focus on the other weakness that can take place with voting. So as long as you have access, the Internet has access to the voting list, that can be corrupted. But they wanted everybody to fo focus on the machine. You know, it was, it was boring stuff. It was interesting in the sense that it was something new. And again, I recommend everybody that wants to, they should sign up to be a poll worker. You know, we need good people out there. Now, in New Jersey, and I think it's the same way in most of the states, there are poll workers. And these are uh, poll workers that administer the daily operations, the mechanics of the daily operations of, of the vote in each precinct, voting precinct. And these are the people that you see sitting behind the desk. You show them, you show them, tell them your name, and they tell you what uh, line to go into, things like that. Now, each uh, voting district is supposed to have four poll workers, two Republicans and two Democrats. And additionally, they're supposed to be challengers, and the challengers are supplied by each party. And I find it just weird. How? Why do they need uh, four poll workers and challengers? Because if – and this is where it gets very vague. You know, wh Why do you need two of each party as poll workers when you have challengers out there? So what is the role of poll worker? And, I'll, and, and this came up uh, later in the uh, – the seminar. So, you know, that, that's where we have, but the, but the interesting thing, and, and this is what I found out is that, you know, the, the, these are bureaucrats teaching the class and you can see that they're skewed because they want to uh, let everybody know. And, and again, even though Morris County is Republican, I don't think that the bureaucrats that run the operations of Morris County are, you know, I, I think they lean left. They're probably de more Democrat than not, but, and I, and I could tell that because when they came in and they tried to show us that the uh, there's no connection to the Internet with the voter, they're clearly trying to get ahead of the curve and try to make people believe that the using uh, electronic voting is good. But after all this is said and done, then at the end of the day, the uh, I think it was like an assistant you know, county clerk or something along those lines. He comes out and he goes, I want to talk about ethics. We have to talk about ethics. And here's what he said. He said, we have to be ethical as poll workers. And he implied that, if, well, if you see something, don't do anything about it. So I raised my hand and said, well, wait a second. Wait a second, pal. I said, if you see something corrupt, you see something fraudulent, you're not supposed to say anything. You have an obligation to say something. That's ethics. Not to look the other way. And this is what he was implying. Oh, just look the other way. It doesn't exist. Let the uh, challengers take care of that. So if you're a Republican poll worker and you see some type of fraud going on, you're not supposed to point it out to the, uh, the Republican challenger. You're supposed, just supposed to look the other way. And that's the definition of unethical. In the warped world of the government bureaucrat, being ethical means looking the other way when you see fraud. And I got a problem with that. So again, I told her, I raised my hand, I said, wait a second. I worked in Hudson County. And there's fraud that's going on, and you're telling us to look the other way? So, And I gave him the example. Here's the example I gave him. I said, look, guy comes in and votes. He comes in online two hours later and wants to vote for uh, as his cousin. And then he comes in another half hour later and wants to vote as his grandfather. We're not supposed to say anything? And his answer, well, that would never happen in Morris County. I'm not saying whether it does. I'm saying, what do we do if we see it? And then I, some Democrat over my shoulder wearing a mask saying, well, that would never happen with these. We can check it. We, you know, the machines will prevent that. And I said, well, wait a second. How is this, these machines we're using going to prevent a gentleman coming in and voting as his grandfather when he's not his grandfather? She didn't know what to say. Some of the people got riled up. And, you know, the, the assistant clerk or whoever was presiding over the seminar just said, oh, well, if that happens, just call me. 
My point was, is well, that's too late. What are you going to do? What, what are you prepared to do if you see that? So they want to know nothing. And that's the problem with the voting system today. The bureaucrats want to know nothing. The Democrats want to know nothing. They just don't want to disrupt the a- apple cart. And that's why it's important for Republicans and MAGA to come out as poll workers. They need competent people, people that understand ethics, understand right from wrong, and understand that if they see fraud, they're going to say something because that's the ethical thing to do. So you may not be able to get in for the midterm elections, but seriously consider becoming a poll worker for the next election, particularly the 2024 presidential election. So what you want to do is you just want to sign up, or go, you know, go into your county website, and there's usually a section for poll workers. Now, I came home. The funny thing is I came home after the seminar. He goes, you know what? I don't think they're going to call me in. I'm not sure if I'm going to work on the election. So we shall see. And let me just give you an update on the unending saga of the FBI versus Donald Trump episode Mar-a-Lago. So what Trump is doing, Trump is petitioning the Supreme Court to allow or request that the Supreme Court allows the special master to review any classified documents before the Department of Justice can use them in their investigation. Now, what happened previously, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals had said that the uh, Department of Justice can can use these documents um, as part of their investigation with outgoing through the special master's review. Well, my point, this is just absurd. Why, why have a special master if the Department of Justice is allowed to review these classified documents as part of their investigation? Shouldn't it first pass through the special master before it goes to the Department of Justice? That's all Trump is asking. And it makes sense that the Supreme Court would let that happen. So we shall see. But in a side note that came out, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, is that the Department of Justice is leaking to the press that Trump still holds classified documentation and they want it. Now, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. But one of my sources said that these documents are damning for the FBI and it has to do with their culpability in this entire Russiagate hoax and this FISA court hoax. And everything involved with getting Donald Trump and the FBI's involvement in getting Donald Trump. So the FBI wants this documentation because they think that Trump is holding on to this damning evidence against the FBI at Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. So this is really interesting. And that's the only reason they want it. So we'll see how this plays out. Again, this is being dragged out and dragged out. And we know what's happening They're trying to speed up this case so they can possibly get some type of indictment or something against Donald Trump, either A, before the midterm election, or B, before the Republicans take over come January 1st. Because once the Republicans take over in January 1st, they're just going to oversee this entire investigation. And they're going to be on the FBI like white on rice. And that's why they want to fast track this thing, because they know their days are coming. So we shall see. All right. So it appears that Elon Musk wants to buy Twitter again, and he's going to buy it at full price at his original price, I think $44 billion. And again, the Democrats and the left are in a meltdown because this is their bastion of fakery. And what Musk has exposed is that there is so much fakery going on. With these accounts, with Twitter, they call them bots, fake accounts. They're just created accounts to make it appear that somebody has more followers than they really do. So it gives the appearance that Twitter is much more powerful than it is, which the Democrats like because they like to play with illusion. And it will make it harder for the Democrats to continue this illusion without Twitter. And that's what this is all about. Now, the interesting thing is that will he close before the midterm election? Because if he closes before the midterm election, he can put the kibosh on a lot of this uh, hanky-panky that Twitter usually 
does before the elections. Good example is Hunter Biden, the laptop story before the presidential election in 2020. So it's going to be interesting. I hope that I hope that Musk gets it, Musk revamps it, and Musk makes it real. So we shall see. I'll tell you, we're in dangerous times. I've been telling you this. And one of the reasons we're in dangerous times is the incompetent people that are running our government here in the United States. And the escalation of a war in Ukraine that could result in nuclear war. You've got comments this week by Biden saying, oh, yeah, you have to you have to believe Putin when he says he's going to use it. It could be Armageddon, something along those lines. And then you got to see the the. the um, his response to the press when he asked this, he just looked like a fool. Well, what do you have to say about that, Mr. President? Are we headed toward nuclear war? And let me just play a quick clip and then we'll come back and discuss. Will you talk to us about Putin, sir? I think Armageddon is coming, sir. And you got to see this. Uh, the reporter's yelling out these questions. And, and Biden is like tiptoe running toward Marine One. It's it just, it, it's like, it's a comedy. It looks like something out of Benny Hill. And these are the knuckleheads that are going to get us blown up. Now, I think I mentioned in my last episode, Zelensky was uh, telling people we should preemptively strike Russia with nuclear weapons. And that was people this week are walking back. Oh, no, he didn't really mean that. He didn't really say that. No, he said it. And you got Biden in the White House here. You got us. You got our co- uh, our Congress shipping more weapons and more aid to Ukraine. Just escalating everything. For a country that is corrupt, It's the third most corrupt country in the world. And we have no high-level national interest over there. But these knuckleheads keep on escalating and escalating and escalating to the point where we are going to get in nuclear war. These are the people who are pulling the trigger. You got Zelensky, a guy that should have settled with Russia before this thing even started. And we know Putin's a butcher. Putin's just going to kill people and grind Ukraine to the to dust. And you have the United States and NATO, the globalists, just escalating and escalating this thing. And for what? Ukraine? You know what everybody may want to do? Take a step back and see what we're fighting for. And I'm sorry, I'm not, I hope I'm not offending anybody from the Ukraine, but I think it's foolish to get into a nuclear war over Ukraine. And I hope stronger minds prevail. And I, you know, I want to play this clip. It's from Kanye West. And Kanye West is being interviewed by Tucker Carlson. And these are profound statements. I have not heard such a profound statement from anyone, particularly in the African-American community, about abortion. I don't think ever. Now, Kanye West, he's a, he's a rapper. He's a... A clothing designer. He was married to Kim Kardashian. And he's interviewed on Tucker Carlson about abortion and what it's done to the African American community. And, you know, the one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, there's so many people out there, particularly on the left, that love to say, well, we're, we're, we're for African American rights. We want what's best for African American. And then you look at the statistics from Planned Parenthood and all these other organizations that, perform abortions and you find out that I think it's 40% of abortions or even more are of African-American kids. So if, you know, African-Americans, if you really love being African-American and you want the African-American community to thrive, you want, you may want to take a second look at abortions. So I just want to play this clip with Tucker Carlson and Kanye West and uh, then we'll come back and discuss because it, it is a profound statement from one of the top African American entertainers in the country, and I think he changed his name to Ye Y E. You know, look, it's a creative thing, but what he's saying is not creative. It's it, it, it's profound. All right, let's go to the clip, and then we'll come back and discuss. Half of a baby's ultrasound. Why is the, and that you designed that? Yes. Why? What does that mean? 
Uh, it just represents life. I'm pro-life. Boy, so you wear it on a badge. What what kind of response do you get? And, and good, amen, I agree. I don't care about people's responses. I care about the fact that there's more black babies being aborted than born in New York City at this point. That 50% of black death in America is abortion. So I really don't care about people's responses. I perform for an audience of one, and that's God. Now, I'm really curious to see what the left is going to do to Kanye. Are they continue the attacks on him? Oh, he's crazy. He needs help. But Kanye doesn't care. Because Kanye's audience is an audience of one. And that's God. And he tells you. I don't care about the noise. I care about what God says. So kudos to Kanye. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint everybody this week, but I will not have a loser of the week. Although there were plenty of losers out there. No one really stuck out that uh, would uh, require me anointing them with uh, a loser of the week for this week. So with that said, let's just go to the, the markets. And I'm just going to give you an abbreviated summary of the markets. The Dow finished down today 2.1% to 29,296.79. The S&P finished down 2.8% to 3,639.66. And NASDAQ finished down 3.8% to 10,652.41. For the week, the Dow was up. 2%, the S&P was up 1.5%, and NASDAQ was up 0.7%. For the year, the Dow is down 19.38%, the S&P is down 23.64%, and NASDAQ is down 31.91%. Okay, let's uh, go to the economic calendar. And for next week, the one thing that should be talked about is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, our inflation and that's on Thursday, and be on the lookout for that. So with that said, thank you very much for listening. You have a good week, and I will talk to you next Saturday.